Hello, and welcome to Best Story Wins. I'm your host, Josh Ritchie, and today I'm joined by my co-host, Jason Linkow, and our guest is Charlie Waite, who is the Director of Product Design at Uber. So, Charlie, I, I think most people are familiar with Uber, uh, but can you give us a little bit of an overview of what your focus is in your current role, and maybe a little bit about your own background? Yeah, yeah, happy to. Uh, first off, stoked to be here. Um, good to meet you guys, finally, and um, catch up, and excited to chat a little bit about design. Um, yeah, so you kind of mentioned it. So I lead all of mobility design uh, at Uber. So uh, really focused on uh, four areas, what we call rider or kind of core consumer app. Folks would know it from, you know, getting a ride to the bar or to uh, the airport or whatever. Um, lead that initiative as well as the earner side. So what our drivers and our couriers use to, to earn on the platform. And then two horizontals, uh, we have safety. Um, obviously, we want Uber to be known as the safest platform for, for ride sharing and, and food delivery, uh, as well as maps. So um, really focused around earner navigation or wayfinding when you're at the airports or uh, pickup and drop off type scenarios. And then, yeah, as far as, you know, background and, and how I kind of got into the design or, or even the journey before, I was at GoPro for four years. Um, split time between um, kind of a director role um, over the software team, um, as well as leading uh, design from an IC standpoint. Um, kind of joined previously from an agency uh, life, which was really great. Kind of doing all things design from graphic design and brand, print design, you know, web design, and then ultimately getting into to product design. Uh, Focus Lab in uh, Savannah, Georgia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Re really cool. I, yeah, amazing. I, I met Bill and Eric, gosh, it was 2000, 2010, 2011. They were still pretty small. Um, I kind of had my own freelance business going at the time. It was just, I don't, as you guys probably know, having a business, you know, you get pulled so far away from the thing that you actually enjoy doing. And I was just like over it and wanted to get back into just designing all day. I didn't care about chasing down clients and money and <laughs> all that fun stuff. Um, and yeah, so connected with them and just kind of hit it off. And yeah, they're doing incredible work. I think that was like really where I realized that design was a profession, which is funny to say, like, you know, I was doing it, I was making a living doing it, but I didn't think about it in the way that I think about it now or even realize how many people were doing it. And at that time kind of found dribble and then I was just like, holy crap, like one, I'm w really bad. I need to get way better at this thing, right? You start seeing all this amazing work and you're like, holy shit, like I, I got to step up this, uh, this skill. And um, yeah, it really became kind of a passion then. I think, you know, I think it was just a thing to kind of pay the bills. And then I kind of really got into it, met other people that were passionate about it and got excited about it. And, you know, here we are 10, 12 years later. Um, pretty stoked on the uh, the lifestyle of uh, of the job. So, so when did you first get into design, and and how did that morph into a specific interest in designing in the tech world? Yeah, I think you know, for me, um, I was always creative as a kid. I loved to draw, loved art. Um, <clears throat> I was an only child, so I had to fill up a bunch of my time. I filled it with two things. One was baseball, and then the other was um, drawing. And so, you know, baseball was my first passion. I actually played in college and, and dipped my toe into the professional stuff. Got drafted by the Phillies and played at Ole Miss, um, which was amazing. And yeah, just like, but that's all I cared about up until I was like 24, right? And so there was a single focus on on just going down that path. But, you know, my dad was, you know, always awesome and super supportive. But he's like, Hey, you always need this like backup plan just in case this thing doesn't work. And, you know, so um, architecture was something that was kind of interesting. Like I said, I like, I love being like creative. I love to draw when I was a kid, but everything I drew was more around like, I don't know, redoing like a, um, you know, a sports logo or uh, I was, I was like crazy in love with like Michael Jordan. Right. Like, and just growing up watching him play and, you know, his shoes were like the coolest things in the world. So I draw like his shoes. So like my art and that creative side always was more like solving a problem versus like telling some story that I just had to get out of me, right? Like a fine art thing. And so 
when I got to college and I was playing baseball, I started looking at the curriculum for architecture and I was like, I don't think I can do all this and, and play, play baseball. They, they call it student athletes. And, you know, I, I don't know why the student part is in there. Um, it's a full-time job, right? Like 80 hours a week of, of, <laughs> of baseball. We're traveling all the time. So just randomly picked art. And so, you know, when the baseball career was over, I, I was, you know, pretty close to finishing up my degree um, so I had some classes that, uh, you know, take. And so when I got back to school, enrolled in some graphic design classes, some like early, like HTML, like CSS web stuff. And I was just, I was, I don't know, was, I don't know about you guys, if, if you've dipped your toe into the fine art, the, the process of a painting or sculpture, I just hated, like, I love that instant gratification of like, oh, I can draw something in Figma or at the time Illustrator or Photoshop and I can just see it right then and I can get rid of it and I can undo. And there was something so satisfying for the way my brain works that I really loved that. And so it, it kind of hit a different, uh, struck a different chord with me, that side of it. I was like, oh, this is really cool. Um, I had some really good connections in the surf industry growing up in Newport Beach and surfing and being sponsored and stuff. And so um you know, I kind of more or less fell into it. It was like, there was no backup plan, but it was kind of that holy shit moment. Like baseball's over, just graduate. What, what do I, what am I going to do? And I just kind of fell into it. Um, like we were talking about just a little bit earlier, you know, it took, I don't know, six, seven years till I realized like, oh, wow, this is something I really enjoy. And there's a, there's a huge world out here where it's becoming more and more of a thing. I think Obviously, with the invention of the iPhone, you know, product design really came to the forefront. People were really exploring more accessibility to things, um, apps now instead of web. And um, so, yeah, just kind of a snowball effect, maybe to, to a roundabout way to answer your question. Yeah, it's really cool. Um, so you've cut your teeth at some, some really cool places. Uh, Focus Labs is a great agency. You talked about GoPro. Um, what's it? been like to work on a product like Uber that has such wide adoption? I mean, it's such a big company that, I mean, to it, it, people say to Uber, right? It's like to Google something you like, that's, that's a big company, right? Yeah. You know, I, I think, I think maybe a fortunate thing for me is like, I never realized that getting into it. Right. I think coming from focus lab, you know, obviously it was a very niche audience. We're working small business. Then you go into GoPro, which is, you know, it's bigger from a, a scale standpoint. It's a little bit more global. It's still very niche, right? Like you've got action sports people, you've got video creators. It's a, it's a very small audience when you really think about it. And then moving to, and you know, I, I think at our biggest time, people-wise at GoPro, we were probably like 2,000 people. And then I remember my first day at Uber and I was like looking at, you know, we have this internal thing called Huber and it was like 30,000 or 35,000 people. And I was like, I was like, holy crap, like what the hell, what, what do these people do? Right. Like, again, I'm still pretty like fresh off, you know, like naive to this whole thing. And like, and the, the experiences I've had were great from a learning experience, but they weren't really like um, connected to that. Right. We didn't have ops um, teams and marketplace and, you know, all these different orgs, you know, is much more, um, you know, streamlined and, and small. And so, and that's just like the organizational side. And then you talk about, you know, just the scale and impact, right? I think we just released some of our um, stuff in our latest uh, quarterly earnings. It's like, we're doing 27 million trips a day. I mean, I, I just can't even like fathom that, right? Like imagine like drawing something and, you know, 27 million people might be seeing that. It's crazy. I, I was just coming home from the airport last night from, from being up at the office and, you know, I'm standing here at the airport with like 30 other people just using the product. It's, it's pretty crazy to your point around like, Hey, it's Uber, it's Google, it's, you know, it's, it's used as that way. Um, but it's also really cool. I mean, I think each area that we focus on, right. So I was kind of giving you guys a overview, right. So rider app is kind of that core consumer app, very consumer, the earner app, obviously people are earning there and then you got some horizontals the user bases are so completely different, right? So what we, how we think about, you know, shipping globally to uh, consumers and, and how they use the product, you know, week over week or month over month versus, you know, an earner who might be spending, you know, seven, eight hours a day in the app, right? 
and then you're, you layer in all the global um, sides of that, you know, you get into like payments and, um, you know, accessibility and just, you know, <laughs> city dynamics, right? I was in India in May and, you know, getting an Uber in India is crazy different, right? Than, than it is here in a lot of ways, but very similar in a lot of ways. So how do you find those things and how do you, how do you uh, design for those challenges is, is super rewarding and, um, I think it's what makes it so fun. It's, I, you know, I'm coming up on six years at Uber and it doesn't necessarily feel that way. No, oh, that's really cool. Um, that's a good sign. Um, so uh, working on a product that gets used, you said 27 million times per day. Um, I imagine you can't just like, you know, decide on a whim to make a change to the product. What, what's, so what's actually involved in making updates or changes? to the parts of the business and product you're focused on. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. It, it is interesting, right? I, I think because we are such a utility app, right? On the consumer side, you know, we're the experience that connects you to other experiences. There's definitely things that are very, you know, you got to be very careful, right? Um, for instance, you know, we have something called the product selector, which is what we call it internally, but, you know, externally facing it's, you know, where you select what type of car you want. Um, that place can be very finicky. So you have to be very careful on, on what you do and, and, and the changes you make. But there's other parts of the experience where, because you're not using it every day, right? You know, I don't know how much you guys have Ubered in the past month, but it, you know, a couple of times, maybe three times, four times a month, you do have a little bit of uh, freedom in that space to, to play with things. And you can take some, you know, I mean, very calculated um, hypothesis driven kind of, um, you know, swings, we try to validate as much as we can between, you know, a, a really healthy balance of user research. We have a kind of incredible, uh, research team, um, and then, you know, really validate with, with data as much as we can and try to find that balance and, and, and then use your, you know, like I, what I t- always try to tell my team, like a good healthy amount of your gut instinct, right. We're, we're a lot of experts in this space and sometimes you can overthink, with all the things we have access to, whether it's research and and data. So I I do try to lead with gut as much as possible, but then on the flip side from an earner experience, you know, you're changing. It's like somebody coming in and changing Figma on a whim tomorrow or whatever tool you're using to, to do your job. Right. And you're just like, where did that button go? Where am I, where's this thing? And so you have to be very, very careful I think the other interesting thing on the earner side is, you know, just understanding the customer, right? You know, we actually have a lot of folks that, you know, you know, the app might be in English, but they actually don't speak English or or read it. And so they rely on the stability of where that button is, maybe the color of the button even. And so understanding that even like the, what you might think is the smallest change can just create utter chaos for them in a, in a day. Um, we're trying to become way more personalized and contextual to kind of combat that. Um, but yeah, those are the things I think you, we, we go through it. And it's interesting to see it on both sides, right? You can be a little bit more free in a lot of ways on the consumer side, but then on the earner side, you know, we've got to be really careful and the change management can be um, something we've got to really, really focus on and help people along that journey if we really feel confident in, in going down a path. That That's fascinating to imagine how those kind of, yeah, cultural and language differences play out and how you uh, make those decisions, you know, especially in individual cities where, you know, th- there's multiple languages spoken and things like that. Um, I, I'm curious, you know, when, when we've started working with Uber, I don't, I don't know, six, seven years ago, we worked a lot with the brand safety team. And that was, that was a big initiative that I, I know, you know, kind of mapped to the CEO's goals. And, um, you can see how these like big business decisions ultimately, um, or like business priorities trickle down into like product design priorities too, right? Like some of that was just, you know, even making people aware and educating people about safety features and how to use new functionality in the app. I'm curious now, uh, what do you see as some of those business challenges uh, 
that you're working hard to help address and how does your team navigate that and kind of re like map your product design choices to business priorities? Yeah. I mean, I think there's some that are always constant, right? Um, you know, safety as you, as you touched on, I mean, I think we always want to be the safest platform that we can possibly be. And, and I think we're really, um, we try to be as thoughtful as we can in anything we design. We try to look at it from all different areas, right? I think another, you know, piece to owning and, and leading a team that has the rider side and the driver side is, you know, we can think about what type of interaction we're creating with a digital interface, right? You know, payments can be very frictionful. Um, how do you think about that interaction that's going to happen in the car? How do you think about, hey, we're going to launch this thing on the rider side for whatever, you know, making things up like easy payments. And then you get into the driver car and car, try to like, driver's like, hey, you haven't paid me yet. And like, oh, I did it through this thing. So like, what are you, like, you thinking it through? So um, it's always something we're, we're battling with and, and really, you know, having the, the most holistic look at. Um, you know, I think within safety or that realm, you know, obviously accessibility is a huge push. How do we, you know, we were talking about um, kind of earners, but I think I saw a stat, I think yesterday, the day before, I think 16% of people these days have some sort of disability. Um, and it's it's only, I guess, getting worse from from what I was, was reading and hearing. And, you know, you have a long COVID, you have some of these things. And so how do we, you know, again, if we're a utility and we're trying to help you get home from, you know, the job every day because you don't drive or whatever that is, like, how long does it take you to book a car, right? Or are you finding the thing that you are, are looking forward to, to help with, you know, service animal or, or so on. So um, I think those things are, you know, and, 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 you know, those types of things will always be driving how we think about building products. Um, you know, I think personally, some of the stuff that I've been pushing my team on is, you know, the rides business is, is quite mature. We've been around for quite a while. And so, really want to become world-class in, in how we think about design and removing dead ends and friction and, and how can we be as helpful as possible. And so I, I think those types of principles, you know, just despite the business goals, you know, are always good things to, to focus on so that we're doing right by the customer, uh, whether that's a writer or an earner or an eater um, and, you know, really kind of help, drive the roadmap and anything in there and you know obviously we do a ton of research to understand what customer pain points are and problems and you know we want to we want to hold those as the the most you know prioritized things you know the business obviously needs things but you know it starts with the customer ends with the customer um i think you mentioned something about challenges i think cha being in transportation you know you've you've always got external factor factors with policy and governments and things that you can and can't do. You know, if we had an extra 12 hours, I could tell you guys how airports work, <laughs> you know, it's very complicated and crazy. Like some of the things, you know, you, you have to do, but when you really look at them, they're kind of like micro cities in themselves and how they function. Right. And how can Uber kind of layer in there to be helpful and not, you know, take up parking and take up, you know, uh, you know, spots and, they're like things so yeah they're yeah, just yeah. like sure you can pick up uh arriving passengers w one mile from their term terminal <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> exactly exactly yeah so yeah I, I hopefully i answered your question a little bit but yeah I, I think there's a lot that you know especially from a design standpoint we we hope to hold as like those really you know unmovable objects and then you know depending on what the business initiative is whether that's you know something that happens in like kind of a more policy area or more of a customer problem we've identified to solve those are kind of what we use to to flush out what that experience might be that's amazing thanks for sharing that yeah so i know you touched on kind of your, your backstory a bit um so for for those listening who are, are listening to you speak right now and they're thinking this seems super interesting um and, you know, they're looking, maybe they're already down the path of working in product design, or maybe they're getting curious about it. What are some things that you would say are the skills that really helped you the most? Um, in, 
in your career thus far and also in your current role right now, um, skills that like an aspiring design leader um, could really focus on developing, you know, in, in, in the next couple of years? Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, it's interesting. I, I, I think I was very fortunate to be self-taught and kind of create this, like you even mentioned it, right? Be like a curious mindset of like learning, right? I think it kind of probably starts there with most people, um, with anything, right? Design, you know, sports, like I, I don't think it matters. Like you, you just got to develop a passion. And I think passion kind of comes from being curious and asking questions and just, you know, learning. So it probably starts there. I, I think for me, you know, you could probably talk to my team and find out if I'm a good design leader or not. But, you know, I, I think I started out because I love to draw. And then that motivated me to get into a place where I could do that as much as I could. And, and that kind of, you know, ended up to happen in solving problems, you know, through a digital mean. And, and so um, I think for me, it's always about the work, right? I think, I think when you get into product design and a lot of these companies, like, as a leader, there's like a really strong bullshit detector from the team. And like, if they don't feel like you can do it, like they have no desire to listen to you. Right. Like what's like, ah, okay. This pre and that's probably extends to anything. Right. I can even remember in baseball when I was like listening to people talk and I'm like, well, what did you do? Like, how long did you play? Like, why am I? And well, that's not a great way to go about things, but I think that's just kind of maybe how we, we naturally do this. Yeah, exactly. And, and so I, I do think, you know, for me, it's, it's about starting with the work, right? Like, you know, do you know what good work is? Can you connect the solution to the problem? Um, craft and quality is something we talk quite a bit about. Um, and so I think that's kind of the hard skills side of it, right? Like, I think that really gives you the ability to maybe connect and lead, right? It, it kind of starts from there. And then when you, you look on the other side of, you know, I think great leaders usually tend to be, you know, lead from the back, humble, soft-spoken. They don't need the limelight, right? Those types of things. And, you know, how do you create trust? Um, I think those are all those things that I've really tried to emulate over my time. You know, I, I would argue sometimes I do them better than others and I'm super competitive and I'm quite reactive a lot of times. I think it's just who I am. Um, so trying to find that balance within me, um, you know, I, I think, you know, maybe speaking a little bit to that, like being authentic to who you are, right. I think is, is, is pretty good. I, when I took over at GoPro, um, I probably tried to emulate too much who my previous boss was because she's amazing, really close friend of mine. Um, and I was like, Oh, that's, that's what it looks like to be a design leader. And I, I tried to use her thing and I just, I, it just failed. And I just remember t to thinking to myself, like, all right, this isn't working. The team doesn't seem to be resonating. The work seems to be going backwards. Like, how do I be me and get the team to, to, to move in a direction? And I think that's what that was. And then I saw, started to see some success with that and I kind of made it my own. And so, you know, I always think that's a, that's a huge thing being super authentic. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, you know, authenticity, trust, you know, on the leadership side, um, setting people up for success, like those types of things, you know, really being kind of, you know, people first on that side, but then having a really strong bar for what the work is, I, I think is super important. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's cool hearing you talk about that. Cause I think every, I think every leader has experienced that watershed moment, if you will. Um, where they realize they they got to stop pretending to be someone else's yeah. version of a good leader yeah, and just exactly. be themselves. Yeah. It's cool yeah. to hear you say that. Um, that definitely rings rings true for me. Um, yeah, and I don't even think. Sorry, not to cut you off, but I don't even no, think like I don't even think I truly like knew it. Right? Like it wasn't like I was like, oh, I'm going to necessarily be this person. I just thought like, oh, that's how you do it. So I'm just going to go do it that way. And it was like it wasn't really even intentional. It, you know, it was just, I was just like, Oh, this is, I, I'm just going to regurgitate it back in a way. And and then I was like, Oh, this is, this is failing really quickly. <laughs> yeah. And it's crazy. Right. Cause it probably got, it probably got easier and the work got better and you're like, okay, I guess I'm doing the right thing yeah. now. Right. Yeah. And, and I was totally 
way happier right like it was yeah. it was a weird like everything was going south you know i don't know how much the team really really felt it and maybe not even the company to be honest with you but like i'm pretty hard on myself so maybe i, I internalized more of it than than most but yeah it was just everything it was like I didn't think the team was happy. I didn't think the work was great. I wasn't happy. I'm now I'm contemplating like leaving or going back to being an IC. I mean, it was just a, kind of a shit show. <laughs> and then I just kind of did a hard reset. And I was like, well, what worked in the past? Okay, great. Well, I can't do that for everything. So I got to figure out how to scale and delegate and, you know, kind of ended up in, you know, you know, that was gosh, seven, eight years ago. And, you know, so where that started to to where it is now, you know, I think I have a fairly good understanding of my strengths and weaknesses and, and how to do it. But um, like I said, you guys maybe could follow up with my team and get a, get, a, get the best answer from them and see, see how much they, they believe that. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe we will on a, on a follow-up episode. Um, <laughs> yeah. That's, that's cool. Um, yeah. A lot of what you said really resonates with me. Um, so as someone who's now, you talked about being an IC and, and you talked about, really loving to draw and being curious um, as someone that's like firmly in a design leadership role um, with a lot of oversight. I imagine a lot of your work is really just keeping, not really just, but like a lot of your work is about keeping people focused on the mission and maintaining that high bar and inspiring folks. What are some things you really start? You really like to, you know, continue getting your hands dirty with and do you have opportunities to yeah. do things like draw on a regular basis yeah i you know i i definitely don't draw as much as i used to um i think going back to the previous conversation i think the, one of the hard things that i have is that you know I, my process to understand and break down a problem that i don't understand is just to jump right in and start playing around right like you know i, I before i even really i, I can I think I've always been somebody that you can just throw anything at me. And like, my first thing to do is like, I'm not going to come back with a bunch of questions to ask you. I'm just going to jump all in and then go through the hurdles of figuring out what questions I need now that I've started to like go down that path. And so I think what I realized early on is like, I stopped drawing at GoPro and therefore like in meetings where I had a pretty good you know, domain knowledge around what we were doing. Like I, I could walk in and I could say some things, you know, like that made sense. And, you know, directionally I could give good feedback and articulate it in places that I didn't, I didn't know how, I didn't even know what the problem was. Like I couldn't, I was just like gut reaction to what I was seeing on the screen because I fundamentally didn't understand it. And so, you know, in areas like that, I, I do still try to draw at some point, like I'm not shipping anything by any means, but you know, like what I tell the team, you know, so I, I, I draw to understand. Um, and sometimes I draw to articulate, right? Like, so sometimes not the, uh, you know, best wordsmith in the world. And sometimes the words that I'm trying to say, like maybe just won't land, but you know, it's hard to ignore what you draw visually and, and, and can capture and send to somebody just kind of through Slack or, or in the Figma and say, Hey, we were jamming on this. Like, you know, this is kind of what I was thinking here or there. Um, so yeah, so, so, so drawing is as much of a part of my day as I can, you know, and, and what fidelity kind of, kind of depends. Um, but uh, sorry, what was the, the second part to your question? Yeah, just more, I think you answered it in saying that you draw, it seems like you draw now to communicate your ideas and help people understand what you mean visually. But I'm, I guess I'm also curious to understand, like, are there, are there instances in which you're finding yourself like in Figma or in Illustrator or, or whatever application and you're actually moving things around? Like, do you get to do some of that still or not? So yeah. Much? Like I said, I, I think it's, yeah, it, it, it's probably more for if I don't feel like I articulated something or if, if I need to understand it, um, unfortunately I just don't have the time. And, and, and honestly, you know, it's a little, if I'm putting myself in like the team shoes, I don't even know how much they love it. Right. Like it's, it's a little, I don't know, maybe I'm, you know, this isn't true, but it does feel a little micromanagey, right. Like when somebody does that. And, and so I, I try to be conscious of that and not go too far, you know, maybe keep it really high level and say, Hey, do with it what you will. Um, but that's probably about as much as I, I get to these days. Um, Although I did just kick off a, a fun little 
side project with the designer because uh, the engineering team is is doing something fun. So yeah, so I, I did I did snag that one for myself because I was like, oh, this is kind of cool. I might do this. So. <laughs> So on the Uber story overall, um, I know you're at the product level. How does the uh, overarching brand story, you know, you touched on some of those things that are always important. We talked about the connection between the safety brand and the product earlier. Uh, what what do you feel like uh, if you think about like that kind of cascade that happens, right? You have the overarching umbrella brand story. Uh, you're connected a bit more, I'd imagine, to like the product marketing effort. And how do you how do you tell that product story? And what what do you what do you think really resonates with people in that? Yeah, I mean, I, I we go back. We've got an amazing brand team. Our um, product marketing team's awesome. You know, some of the some of the new videos we've been launching are incredible. If you get a chance to go check some of those out. I think, you know, anything successful in brand or storytelling um, is really just connecting it to the problem, right? And, and like I said, we, you know, we're, a, we're a very much a utility app on the mobility side. And so a lot of people have real world problems, right, that they need for us me, to solve. And, and uh, you know, I think it has to start there. I mean, you can have a beautiful brand creative, you know, piece or whatever, and it can be very fluffy if it doesn't like really connect. And so I think, you know, starting there is like, Hey, are we building a feature or a product that's actually solving something that our, our, our riders or earners desperately need from us? Um, so it probably starts a lot there. And then I think for us, you know, it's, it's how, how do you make that sticky or, or remember something you can remember, um, our app is very high intent, right? I'm sure neither of you guys have opened up Uber just to cruise around Uber, the app, and see see what's going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. probably not even in prep prep for this, right? You're just like, no, I'm just you know need a need a ride home or something like that. And so because our app is that way, you know, we talk a lot about um, high intent use cases, right? You're coming here to get a ride, and you know you're at the airport after a long trip. It's just like you don't really want it us interjecting brand or, you know, messaging to you that's not not helpful in the moment. So we try to be as cognizant as we can with that. Um, but we also talk a lot about findability, right? So if you are, you know, watching like the Super Bowl and you see an ad for something like Uber Reserve, which allows you to like schedule your ride ahead, hey, when you come into the app, can you go find that thing? So I think, you know, we live much more on kind of the taking action side and, and work really closely with the, the brand and the marketing team to see how they're telling a story um, and then we use our app and, and what we know um, or where's the right time to get in somebody's way, where isn't the right time. Is it, you know, I would, you know, I'd even say like, you know, is it just a button versus like a, a an advertising kind of like illustrative message? Is it a full screen takeover? Is it, you know, even something more lightweight? I think those are the things that we've really tried to play with um, to understand how we connect between the two areas. Um, so it feels natural in the moment versus, um, you know, like a blocker. So you've touched on the uh, kind of overall user experience quite a bit. And I'm curious, you know, it seems like you're speaking uh, on some level to a design philosophy. And I'm curious what what really is like your guiding light on this or, you know, uh, what what guides your your approach to design? Yeah, I, I think at Uber, like when we talk about the consumer app, it's, you know, meet the customer where they are. So that's kind of what we're talking about, right? Hey, we know what you're trying to do here. Like, let's not get in your way. Let's help you accomplish the thing you want to do. And, you know, um, maybe down the road, we can kind of help you learn about this new thing or, you know, maybe in the moment that is the most helpful thing. So we, we say that a lot, meet the customer where, where they are. Um, I think a new one for us, you know, is, you know, no dead ends. Um, you know, it wasn't too long ago, Uber were, from a, a rider side was really geared around on-demand economy rides. That's all we really offered. We did a really, really good job with that. 
but a lot of the experience was was built on that and as we started to graduate into more of a platform with you know things like eats or new verticals as far as different types of mobility uh, things that you can do rental cars and you know charter buses things like that um there's just a lot of dead ends right we would send you down to flow you'd find out that's not the thing you wanted and like oh crap, now what do you do? And so really trying to unlock that for people. So if they do make a mistake, it's, it's easy to get out of. Um, you know, those are probably the two that I, I, I feel good sharing <laughs> publicly. Um, but we also talk, you know, you know, I, you know, safety is a huge principle and accessibility, um, you know, working really close with our design systems team to make sure that, you know, those things are just, you know, built into the core of the product. Um, but yeah, I think those are the, probably the two biggest ones is, you know, the, the, the meet the customer where, where they are and, and no dead ends. So we kind of know from, you know, I guess decades of observing brands we like and, um, uh, you know, rely on and so forth that product design, good product design, it can be a really strong differentiator and even sometimes could be pointed to as, as like a key success factor for a brand that wins or dominates or becomes like a top leader in a space. Uh, do you think it matters? You know, we've seen some studies over the years just about like, uh, I guess even like how, you know, people attempting to quantify <laughs> the value of good design of, uh, you know, some, on some level, some, you know, some roles or, or even certain companies will, you know, sometimes thumb their nose at it or, you know, the amount of work that goes into doing something simple and elegant, you know, might not be obvious to people at times, but I'm just kind of curious if you think it matters at all, or if you ever feel like your team has to justify like, and like quantify the value to the company of, of good design thinking. Uh, yeah, hundred percent agree. It's like a lot of that. I, I think for us, it might not be so much, uh, does design matter or, or, you know, is it, should it be, um, something we focus on it, it, I think the hardest part is when push comes to shove is, you know, speed, velocity of building things, you know, where you are as a company, right. Are you in hyper growth mode where like, polish and those things might not make the most sense, right? You're trying to get to like category position in, in a certain area and, you know, you got to figure out when to sacrifice as a designer. <laughs> and having done this for a really long time, you know, tech debt and design debt, you know, that's a really, really hard thing to come back from. And, and so, you know, I would always err on, hey, experience matters. I do think you can measure it. Um, you know, what parts of it you can you measure versus others, right? Like, hey, this illustration performs better, rounded corners feel more clickable. Um, you know, how janky is the experience? Does that start to erode trust? I mean, I, I think it's it depends on what you're trying to do and, and how you want to, to measure it. And sometimes I, I think, you know, unfortunately, I think oh, what's happened over the last few years is like, I just don't know how much people care anymore. And I'm not speaking to any single company here, certainly not to, to Uber, but like it does feel like all the, the product design experiences out there are starting to become very similar, right? It's really easy just to be, oh, let's do a feed because, you know, a certain company does a feed and that seems to be successful, even though <laughs> you have no idea whether the, they're hitting their metrics or not, but you just, well, that's kind of cool. We'll just do that. And so like, I do think that is a little scary. I think we've gotten, it's funny as, as the discipline has grown quite a bit, I actually feel like we're regressing in a lot of ways because it's really easy just to find something you like and then repeat it. Um, there was something really cool kind of in that like 2008 to 2000, like 10, 11 period where, you know, you had like skeuomorphic design and you had all these like people just trying stuff. You know, I, I remember going to a talk and uh, the designer who did Vine, I don't know if you guys remember Vine, which is, you know, kind of, yeah, like he had never built any web or pro, he was a brand designer. <laughs> like that was his first thing he ever did. 
and like how cool and amazing that product was. And it was just so fresh and unique. And yeah, I think we're, unfortunately, you know, product design is, is, you know, partly and a lot of it driving business, you know, metrics and things like that. And, you know, you start to lose a lot of that creativeness. You start to lose some of that craft and quality and, you know, you start looking at the metrics maybe more. And so, um, you know, it, it's tough. I think, you know, that's why you need strong advocators for it. You need to, you know, educate people and, and help them understand why it matters. And, you know, you can see it when, you know, you're using a really delightful experience versus one that just works. Right. I mean, sometimes it's, you know, peanut butter and jelly, right. You just, it is, you know, Craigslist is always the best one I use, right. Like it's still around. It's just, a, just a bunch of links on a page and, you know, it, it seems to work and it is what it is, but I don't know. I always feel like if I'm going to take the time and think through something and, and, and actually devote some time to it, like why can't it be the best as it can? And then, you know, obviously depending on timelines and some of those things, you have to make concessions, but yeah, hopefully you can get to a world where you make way less of those concessions. I think that's why there's been such a huge move in product design to like really strong design systems thinking and, and building engineering to improve velocity so you're not having to rethink everything when you do it, right? You can really, really focus on the on the, the problem at hand. Um, yeah. It's so funny you mentioned skeuomorphic design because I have heard rumblings um, from different corners of the internet that that's going to be making a comeback in a, in a big in a big way in the coming years, and I don't know, we'll see. But um, on that note, I mean, what what's a trend that you think people should be moving away from, or um, maybe another way of framing that is, are there things that you're seeing people do right now, brands do, that you think we should be kind of moving away from in mass, or maybe things you're seeing work well, um, but haven't been fully adopted yet, and so we should kind of dive into that. Yeah, there's there's something interesting where I think you're kind of touching on it, right? I, I, I do feel like there's a lack of being bold, right? I mean, that's, you know, that's kind of what design and brand and all that stuff was, was to kind of like stop you in your tracks and, you know, right or wrong. I don't know if it's always the best <clears throat> thing for product design, but, um, you know, something that I always thought about when I was an IC is like, look, if I'm going to show up in a design review, I either want you to say, holy shit, that was the best thing I've ever seen. Like we have to build that or holy shit, what the hell are you even thinking? Right? Like I, I want those ends of the spectrum. I don't want, <laughs> oh yeah, cool. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, let's move on to the next thing. Like I just never understood that, right? And, and it wasn't like a, a self thing, but it was like, I always felt like there was an opportunity to, to push a boundary one way or another. And like, I, like we're talking about, obviously, I think some of that has changed a little bit in, in how I think about building a global product and you start thinking about safety and accessibility and all those things. Okay, maybe that doesn't quite fit into that mindset anymore, but there is something to it, right? You know, I think, you know, the bummer about product design, I think people have kind of beat up is, you know, oh, it's not a creative space or why you're so attached to this thing. And it's like, it's like anything. It's like, well, if you're going to show up and do it, you should be attached to it. You should be passionate about it. You should have a point of view, not to say that you should, you know, ignore feedback or, you know, be so you know sensitive that you, that it, you know, you can't move past it to find a happy medium, but, you know, I think we've, we've taken away that creativeness. So maybe that's the trend, right? Like how do we get back to some of that, you know, style and, and a strong point of view and, you know, be bold and, um, I mean, you even see it a lot with like product thinking, right? Like I'm sure somebody's pitched you guys at a lunch. It's the Instagram of the Facebook of the Shopify. And you're like, that sounds terrible. Like, I don't like, so you're just gonna incrementally try to make this better. Like, how's that going to go? I mean, I think there's some pretty good case studies on like threads right now and like how it's probably the fastest growing thing to ever happen because they just had a built-in, you know, channel for folks and it grew crazy. Twitter was on fire. It was just like, but like, how sticky is that? Right. I go on there now and I'm like, nobody over here, nobody, nobody's talking on here. And so you, you do run the risk of just doing something incrementally better. 
um, there's, there's a really good podcast. I'm, I'm forgetting the guy's name. Um, but he talks about, you know, designing the category. Um, and so I do see a trend of folks, you know, not doing that anymore. Right. They're just kind of, all these startups are just kind of, oh, one upping this thing a little bit. And so it's, it's kind of a dangerous thing. And I think it kind of, you know, goes into, to the design world as well. It's just like, oh, let's just do that, but a little bit better. Right. It's like, yeah, it, it's, it's like, sure, that's a great place to start, but how do we make it our own? And then like, what, what happens once we make it our own, right? Um, and, and, and so I, I, w- I would love to see more of that. Um, but yeah, I think between that and, you know, taking some more risk and being bold, having more just brand designers building social media apps, right? Like, <laughs> I'm still blown away. Like, yeah, I just made one of the most impressive apps and had n- never done any of it before. I was just like, yeah, okay, maybe this isn't that hard. Yeah, it's almost like that lack of experience enabled him yeah. to do something totally uh, totally unique, right? Yeah, I think maybe we've just gotten – we've outsmarted ourselves a little bit, <laughs> right? Um, but Into playing it safe, yeah. I could not yeah, be. exactly. <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about that passion project, yeah. Yeah, let's, let's talk about me getting fired by the no. kids. Um, yeah, you know, I, look, I, I, yeah, I probably can't talk too much. I think, look, we, the company, I've been at the company six years. Uh, you know, I've seen us be a lot of different things that came in, you know, when we were thinking about, you know, some pretty crazy stuff. And, and I love the fact that, you know, Dara, who's our CEO, really came in and kind of focused us as being who we are and being really excellent at that. So I think you know, we'll, we'll continue to pursue that. Like I talked about, you know, I'd love to, at least internally for the teams that I lead, get it, getting really, really crisp on those experiences so that it's just like, there is no other option. You know, I think, I think, you know, other options are great because it keeps that competitiveness, but I, I like that idea of us just being so world-class in what we do and just like, you know, being kind of that beacon. Um, you know, I'd love to see the team, you know, get to that level of execution. Um, you know, and, you know, every, like I said earlier, you know, being here six years and feeling fresh and, and excited about it, you know, because it's ever changing, like the, the experience is pretty simple, right? We talk about a lot and say like, you know, push a button, get a ride, but what happens, you know, underneath the hood there is so complex, right? It's, it's, it's really amazing that, you know, you have a marketplace at, a global scale like that and, and how it functions and, and, you know, things you need to react to. And, um, you know, it kind of keeps you on your toes and it's all an effort to make sure we can, you know, help somebody, you know, put food on the table on their inner side and help, you know, somebody on the other side, maybe get to a job or get to a fun family function or to the airport or whatever it is. And so I think that will always be kind of what's next for us and what flavors of those, um, come about will be really cool. So. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, well, Charlie, Hey, it's been, uh, a lot of fun hanging out and, and chat with you. Um, and hear about hearing about how you work and what your team is up to. Uh, if people want to learn more about you and, and follow you along, where's the best place to find you online? Yeah, uh, probably just Instagram at Charlie C. Wait. Um, unfortunately I had <laughs> left the, the X or the Twitter or whatever it was, I just couldn't couldn't deal with it anymore. And like I said, maybe threads too. I'm not really too active there, unfortunately. So Instagram is probably, probably the best place. Only good stuff though, only happy stuff. So if you like surfing and family photos, that's probably what you're going to see a lot of. <laughs> awesome. Sounds like my Instagram too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Well, thanks a lot, man. Thanks guys. Super fun. Appreciate the chat.